Hey there, horror fans! It's me, James Ferguson. So, due to a scheduling snafu, I don't have a guest this week. I've got a few horror comic creators lined up for the next batch of episodes, but this ended up being an awful. Don't worry though, I prepared for this. This has happened once before in between episodes 25 and 26, where I played the introduction episode of the first but lost Horror Talk podcast. If you watch this, I'll read that. So, get ready for the next one. If you haven't listened to that episode, here's a quick recap. The show is hosted by myself and my editor, Steve Petit. The idea is that I don't watch a ton of horror movies, and Steve doesn't read a ton of horror comics, so he'd give me a movie to watch, and I'd give him a comic to read. Then we'd come back and talk about it. This is the first discussion episode where I watched The Exorcist for the first time ever, and Steve read one of my all-time favorite horror comics, Colder. Now, this was recorded a few years ago, back when Colder was just a single miniseries. Now it's a whole trilogy, and honestly, all of them are worth checking out, so please do that. Anyway, we recorded four episodes of If You Watch This, I'll Read That over the course of several months. These never made it out into the world because we couldn't quite get on a more routine schedule. I intend to launch a Patreon for Funny Book Spider by the end of the year, and this show is one of the goals I've outlined. I want to try to carve out at least one of these a month. So, if you like the show, please, please, please let me know. I can be reached via email at jferguson at horrortalk.com or on Twitter as at James Ferguson. I would love to hear what you think. We'll be back to our regularly scheduled programming next week, but for now, please enjoy this Funny Book Spider interlude with the first official episode of If You Watch This, I'll Read That. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second edition of If You Watch This, I'll Read That, a new podcast from HorrorTalk.com. Uh, I'm James Ferguson. I am Steve Patti. And we are now, we've now gotten to the point where we have each given each other recommendations for those new to the show. The first episode we talked about, I don't watch that many horror movies, Steve doesn't read that many horror comics, so the idea was, let's compare some notes. So, last time he gave me a horror movie... I gave him a horror comic. Now we're going to compare notes and then get into the next batch of recommendations. So, but exciting times uh, so far because it's it's kind of opening the door to a, a number of new. Well, I, well, I hope to be a number of new <laughs> uh, uh, comics and movies for both of us. So, uh, I guess the I'll I'll start then with my with because the, well the first part is if you watch this. So I watched that. So. <laughs> Steve's recommendation last time was The Exorcist, the uh, 1973 movie, I want to say. That sounds about right. I don't remember seeing that one in the drive-in yeah. so it, it, before <laughs> I was born. kind of sucks because IMDb was down today. Uh, uh, I, just, I just Googled it. It is 1973, so uh, William Friedkin directing... The Exorcist. Now, and as mentioned for the last episode, I didn't really know much about it. The only thing I knew was what was spoofed in other movies. I knew that there was a little girl who something happened and she yelled at people. Like that was the extent of it. <laughs> Which, you know, that could be like the. That's also the plot of Juno. So it's it's not really <laughs> the same thing. A little bit different. <laughs> yeah. Did, so uh, was I good? No, I, I I was I'm very eager to know what you. Th- think mainly because i as i believe i mentioned in the first episode this is not we're in a different time now and slow burns are fewer and further between and this is a very this is i believe this movie's uh two hours yeah and more than two hours hour, yeah. nothing yeah first hour not i don't want to say nothing happens but the first hour is mainly character development, and I believe everything you've probably seen homaged or perhaps even made fun of happens in the last 15 minutes. Yeah, and, and that that's correct. So slow burn is a great way to describe it, but it's a good slow burn. And I overall, so just as, as to, to put this out of the way, I really like the movie. So we watched it on Netflix. It's the, the rated edition. Mm-hmm. It's not whatever's out on DVD or whatnot. And you're right, it is a very slow burn. You spend like a good half hour, 45 minutes getting to know this handful of characters. You have the the priest, you have the the little girl and the the, the mom, whose names I don't remember, but they're they're all just kind of like getting, they have this like normalcy with it, where you're getting these seemingly unconnected stories between the actress, which is the mom, the priest, 
the little girl, and it's just like, look at how normal and happy these people are. Like, everything's fine. Yeah, <laughs> there's, there's some weird stuff going on. I will say the opening scene... It caught me a little off guard because it's like it's in Iraq and there's right. it's it's just strange and it wasn't really what I was expecting at all and it seemed almost disconnected from the movie as a whole. Yes. So that was odd to start, but then once it got past that, it was fine. How amazing! I mean, how, now this one, if I'm not mistaken, this won an Oscar for effects, and part of it is well, naturally. We'll get to the head turn in a minute, but part of it is, too, how amazing does Max von Sydow look? He looks like he does now, and he <laughs> was 40 years old when this movie was made. So he looks he looks like a 70-year-old man, so it kind of blew my mind if you kind of look up pictures. Like, I was sending you pictures, and, and audience, the three of you listening right now, go and look him up at that time period and look at what he really looked like, and then look at The Exorcist. And it's just a little bit mind-blowing, like... Whoever did – I can't remember who did the makeup, and, and it's killing me because that's, that's a damn shame on my part. Um, but they basically made him – they made a future him. Yeah, with, and, not, and not stupid. Like the, if you look at even, – even look at recent movies. Look at the last Harry Potter movie where they, they fast-forwarded and made them all older and they had kids. They looked horrible. They <laughs> looked like they had silly putty on their faces, but that looked really good. Yeah, it was – and I, I believe that's one of the – I mean uh, – Granted, you get to um, you get to the effects at the end, but th- this is very understated and very you know it's so understated that you miss it, and that's what really amazing effects do. Yeah. Now, so the the thing about that really got me about this movie was that it was you had that normalcy, and then the the events that happen are more unsettling at first than scary. So it, it like it starts with a little girl peeing on the floor and it's just like that is a, an uncomfortable scene because it's at a, like a cocktail or like a dinner party of some kind and all the everyone's laughing they're playing the piano everyone's like oh this is great and then this little girl comes out and says they're all going to die and pisses all over the floor in the middle of everything like what a downer for the party <laughs> first of all party ruined <laughs> And to, to nerd out a little bit when she tells the the astronaut you're going to die up there he there is a that is a character in another movie by the um by the Blatty who wrote the book. He wrote another book and man it's escaping me now and I wish I'd written it down. But in this other book that became a movie, there is an astronaut who either died in space or was afraid to go to space because he would die. And that's the same character. The character tra- traverses through uh different novels. See but God. That's crazy. That's like the Avengers before the Avengers. Like everyone, everyone gives like Iron Man credit because he showed up in the Hulk movie. But now you have this thing happening forty <laughs> years ago. Yeah, it, it's it's small and it's one of those little trivia things. Um, it, uh, uh, now I'm paying attention. To my stuttering now, but the, I, I can tell you what the movie is, and it's it's another kind of um, the ninth configuration. That's what it is, uh, and then. The character, like, it's one of those little small, uh, almost irrelevant, but it's interesting that, like I said, these these characters, that particular character goes different ways. But um, to, to what you were saying, it's so, her pee on the floor is so uncomfortable. And still, to as uncomfortable as the movie is, one part that always gets me is when they take her into the hospital oh. and they put the needle in to do the, I guess it's a spinal tap. Or, yeah, or, that was that whole scene was just oh. so uncomfortable. <laughs> it was and, like, it was tough to watch. And it's like, that isn't even the scary part of the movie, but that's no. like the more realistic part of it, because it's like, you could think about going to the doctor. Like I've been to the hospital. I know what that looks like. I don't right. know. I don't know what it looks like to be possessed, but that was, was just like, you know, it's tough to cringing, like trying to watch that. And that's what I love about this movie is is I don't think you could get away with all that time spent nowadays because no. she goes through everything before we get to, oh, maybe she's possessed. I mean, and that's like an hour in yeah. before she finally goes to the priest, and she's not even religious. She's <laughs> – which there's so much that comes into this, like there's so much that works and so much that comes together. And it's like you said, we're setting up here. We'll, we'll tell you about this piece over here. Um, I don't know if you noticed. I it, it took me like three viewings. I didn't notice until about the third viewing as I was growing up. The when the pr- 
the uh, the priest that is not a big role. It's just a regular priest, uh, just a regular scene. Walks in and sees the was it the Virgin Mary with the the defaced. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I that, remember that. that. Okay, do you remember that thing she found in the basement? That little stuffed animal paper mache thing. Yes, it's very similar to mm-hmm. what the defacing of the Virgin Mary or oh. the uh, Mary was. And I'm like, okay, so there's a lot of stuff going on. And after multiple viewings, uh, you start to see, wait a minute, that kind of looks like that. So what's going on here? So, yeah, so it's – it's and, I, and like I said, it's unfortunate, but I don't think people have the patience to sit through something like that well, nowadays. It, it seems like it's like it's a smart movie. It's one, yeah. it's it's something – but it's not one of those boring smart movies because there's a lot of those out there. It's like, oh, you just didn't get it. No, it's very easy to get The Exorcist. You just have to like take the time to do it. It's not that you know you can't be checking your cell phone during it. You have to just be paying attention to it. And I did. I turned everything off. The only thing I did have, I, I had, an, I did have it in my email window open because I was typing up notes to make sure I remembered stuff. Right. But you know, I immediately put it down and then just appreciated everything in the movie. It was, it was, it that slow burn is a great way to describe it. It really is. And the what I what I got from it afterwards, I was trying to think of a best way to describe it. It's almost like a. When you're in the hospital, if you're hooked up to one of those things that checks your uh, your heartbeat, and you know that little like beep 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 beep, you see that little um, you know zigzag thing going across, and then when they die, it goes the flat line. Yes. I don't know what the hell that's called. That was like the longest explanation for that thing ever. But it was. <laughs> I was thinking of that because it's a heart monitor. Heart monitor. That would make sense. That's a that's a name that makes sense for that. But I was thinking of that, and it. it it's like you have these little, it's like normal, and then all of a sudden something very drastic happens, something very scary and quick happens. Sometimes the, the scene is like less than a minute long, whether it's just like her, sh- like the bed shaking or something like that, and then it ends abruptly, and you're back to normal, and just like, okay, these are these people, it's like, my daughter's sick, I'm just trying to figure out what's going on with her. And then it happens again. Like it's So you get this moment to kind of catch your breath, yes. and then it just scares the shit out of you again and then it goes back to that normal and but those scenes that that that, those calm scenes get shorter and shorter as the movie progresses until you have the ending which is like in an intense like 10 minutes of of them trying to uh, exercise the girl and and it's just like you can't look away by that point because you're so engrossed in what's going on and that's what makes that so jarring is is everything is normal. Everything's normal. The bed shakes. And this is one of the few movies where, like, I'm I'm I am that guy that says the the bed shaking. Get the fuck out of the house. Get out of the house. <laughs> but at the same time, that bed shakes a little bit. You're like, uh, okay. Well, you're, I can see her saying, well, maybe it was nothing. Yeah, maybe your mind your me. mind could explain it, thinking, oh, well, maybe it was. You know, I, I jumped on the bed and it shook a little bit, or we were jumping a little bit. No, yeah. that thing was flying off the ground. <laughs> now, the scene where 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 McNeil, uh, Chris, that's the mother, walks into the room and everything's going over, and she, she falls down, and then the, 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 the cabinet rolls across and hits her. Mm-hmm. In real life, that hit her so hard, it, I think she might have had back problems for the rest of her life. Wow. She went to the – if I'm not mistaken, she might have gone to the hospital, but even if she didn't, it's it's another one that's notorious. They they pulled it, they pulled it too hard, mm-hmm. and, and what you see is real. She really got messed up in, in that uh, thing. But I think there's just so much to see a little girl – again, jarring when a little girl is taking the crucifix – Oh. And penetrating herself <laughs> and saying, fuck me, fuck me, fuck me. It's not just the religious aspect that just makes that so dirty. Or the 10-year-old girl, or what is she, 12 or whatever. It's just everything. Everything just makes that so ugly. And so I'm not even religious, man, but yeah. you got a crucifix. It's, it's a uncomfortable. It's everything uncomfortable. wrong, yeah. And that's what, like, you've seen that sweet little girl up to that point, and yes. it's, it's just shocking to see that. And it's not shocking for shock's sake, so it's not just like, oh my god, isn't this crazy? Like, it's not the, it's not a, the Miley Cyrus of, of the movie. It's, <laughs> right. it's very, it's just, it's shocking and just, like, unsettling, and, and it's scary. That's the thing. Like, it gets, it gets in, so it's not a jump scare. It's not just like this, she just, like, jumped out from the middle of nowhere and, and scared you. It's, it's just un unsettling and creepy yeah. to see that stuff 
and you don't even see anything. That's the thing. You don't see anything. You see your arm go up. Yeah. Arm go, arm go up. I thought you see blood come out. I think. No, you see a little bit yeah. of blood, but as far as you don't see, no. thank God, you don't see any penetration, which no. I wouldn't want to. That would just be what, no. yeah. But it, it, And it's almost worse because your mind is filling in what she's doing, yeah. and it's the most horrible thing in the world. So that was that was it was it was good. The overall, it was the, the flick was really good. You know, and then I was thinking about it like overall with how it's normal people with normal lives, and suddenly some crazy shit happens. Right. And if you look at a lot of Stephen King's work, if you look at the early M Night Shyamalan stuff, it's mm-hmm. the same formula. Right. You know, some normal people they have normal everyday lives, and then something completely extraordinary happens to them. And they're thrown into this. But by that point in the story, you're engrossed in their lives and you you care about how they're going to get out of it. And it makes it's more it's even worse because this is a demonic possession of a child of someone who doesn't believe ha, have any religious beliefs. Mm-hmm. So in turn, I would ass, it's it's safe to assume her child does not go to church. So. That is even more terrifying because you you assume or you figure this – the people who are religious will get the demons. And the people <laughs> who don't believe in it, well, they won't get them because they don't believe in it. No, no, no. It doesn't work that way. If it can happen to them. It can happen to any of us. Yes, yes. Now, I'm curious because it still gets me. It still shocks me, but I don't know how much of it is – it's always shocked me, and, and I'm kind of rolling off when I first saw it at like 12 or whatever. The head flipping around, the the infamous head scene where her head just rotates. Is that still effective to somebody who's never seen it? I, I think it is to an extent. It's not. It wasn't like holy crap. That's that was amazing and really terrifying. Right. But it it was definitely an impressive effect effect but i don't think it carried the same gravitas that it might have when the film debuted right right that's what i was kind of worried worried about because i look at it i'm thinking i think this is me giving a letting it get away with something Mm -hmm. because it's i love the movie i mean my review was five stars across the board of the the uh i really want you to see like the version you've never seen now because there's really since you like that like you have to give it time. You have to let this settle. You can't yeah. come back to back. But there are, there is a scene in that. I think I sent you the link, but it's still, it's still kind of terrifying when she goes down the stairs backwards. Um, I mean, crawls down the stairs like a crab. That's just, mm-hmm. she did that. If I'm not mistaken, she did that for real. Or maybe no, I think they might have had a, um, a, a gymnast do it. I can't remember. But there's so much nerdy stuff uh yeah, it sound, i mean it sounds like it's it's the kind of thing that i would want to read about more like it was an interesting movie and it's just one of those things where it's just like this is just the overall everything about it each character aside from that weird iraq scene i guess i think that was the one thing that really just like and it was right away and it's like i don't get why that was even later on i still didn't see what the point was for that scene because it just established like here's this old guy and he looks at rocks like that that's that's all i got <laughs> no i'm with you on this i mean i've watched i can't tell you how many times i've watched it but that's still a scene that i think that, dare i say it could be cut oh or yeah exercise I, i'm telling like i've seen i just watched it like that that's yeah. completely unnecessary now and and if, but here's the thing if i'm sure that there's someone right now listening going like you're fucking wrong that's that <laughs> That's yes. because that thing shows up over here. Now, I know one of the detectives that was investigating the uh, the director's death, yes. where he fell down the stairs, yes. he finds like a little thing, like a little artifact or something in the leaves That's down there. The same artifact. Wasn't that the same artifact that he had it found? Was, I, I don't wherever. know if it was the same one or one that was very similar to it, but even then, it's still unnecessary with that, that weird desert scene in the beginning. I still don't think it's the same. It's, it's necessary because you don't know what that thing is that he finds in the beginning you know there's no connection to it and it's not like by him finding that in the desert it unlocked the demon and it it, it let him let the demon possess this little girl it, right. it seems to have no connection but here's the thing listeners if you are calling us idiots right now and you want to tell us that write in and tell us it's at watch this read that at horrortalk.com email us and tell us how wrong we are about this or if you agree with us in that case uh, and I, I'm going to ask, I, I wonder how much of it 
is from the book because I didn't read the book. I, I, I can touch base with Zigzag because uh, fellow reviewer Zigzag, he reviewed the book, and I should ask him because he recently he read the book like uh, about a year ago, if that. So it should still be still be relatively fresh, and that was not the first time he's read it. So I'm going to touch base with him as well. Maybe he'll tell us how wrong we are, or maybe how right we are on this, <laughs> because. Um, it, it, that's something that has bothered me too, because I know it's established in the character character uh, of Father um, Mirren. Uh, see, this is how horrible I've seen this so many times. About my, <laughs> but I know it's established in the character of Father Mirren. But is that the only way you could do it? But it, it does give him a fantastic intro when he, you know, the, the symbolic shot poster of him with the fog and the light coming down outside the house with his with uh, yeah. his briefcase is amazing but that's uh, that's later on in the movie yeah that's not that's not the thing it's not like you needed this indiana jones opening scene <laughs> for some reason you know yeah and with the clocks and it's effectively yeah. creepy it's effectively cre- creepy with the clock stopping the dogs fighting and but but it would have been effectively creepy for a different movie it just it yeah. feels just out of place. But look, if that's the only thing I, if the five minute opening scene is the only thing I really have to complain about, I, I'm not really, I, obviously I like the movie. It's just, you know, I'm right going to nitpick about those, these little things that I'm just like, I don't get that. And that, you know, if I were to review it, I would have called out the same thing. Cause I still don't understand why they did it. I, but, it's completely fair. Yeah. It's completely fair. All right. I'm just, I want to see if there's any other notes I had about this that I, uh, Oh, I did think the, sh- the soundtrack was used very like sparingly. So yeah. it was. It was very. It wasn't. You know. Again, going comparing it to modern day horror movies, I mean, horror and movies in general. Honestly, they this, they use the soundtrack to try to amplify things. You know, you have the tension. Oh my god, this person's walking through the dark room, and there's something that jumps out of the closet, and it's and the music spikes, and you're able to jump. But there was very subtle uses of the soundtrack throughout the entire movie. So it's almost to the point where you didn't even notice it, and I think that really helped it and helped the realism of the movie in a big way. Yes, yes. I I hate again. Uh, I'm going to get screamed at. Maybe. Um, that's a good point. And when you said sparingly, my first thought actually went to um, Halloween because as much as I like that that Halloween soundtrack, I actually listen to it uh, often. It's not used so sparingly in the movie. That that theme that theme is played throughout the movie once Michael's introduced and. Here, I was actually a little bit rewatching it again. I actually kind of thought too was, huh? You don't hear that that song for something that everybody knows mm-hmm. as often as you think you would. Yeah, for for something that has become that iconic, it's not in the movie that much. Right, right, right. And then uh, the only other note I had was that if, if the ending did feel a little, I don't want to say abrupt, but it just it felt. Maybe it was just it felt that way, that it was very quick. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like we had all this build up to the exorcism and then it happens and it's it's you have this huge action scene between the, the, the priest and, and there. I mean, it's obviously. Well, hold on a minute. If we got that, if you've gotten this far in the podcast, spoilers. OK, <laughs> like I hope by, I hope you figured that out by now. But in any case, yeah, the uh, it, it, it felt just like it went really quickly. Like I, we had all this build up and then that that final battle if you could call it that yes it wasn't that wasn't that long but it's still very satisfying and very it, 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 i don't know how else to describe it what it was good is it felt like it happened very quickly but maybe that's just how i felt when i watched the movie like after being through everything that it just felt like it went quickly but i don't know no it, it does feel that way but here's the thing if you don't watch it for a year or two years or three years or whatever you know you're not going to watch the same movie every week in two or three years it's going to get to a point where the most you're going to remember is that that last 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. You're going to sit down and watch it again. You're like, I don't remember all this stuff, but man, I forgot how good this was. Yeah. And that happens every time I watch it. I forgot how good this was. And then when it finally gets, and when I say finally, I don't mean finally, <laughs> but when it finally gets to that last 10, 15 minutes, you're like, man, that buildup is so worth it. But but you're right. It seems like it goes so fast because of the hour and 45 that precedes it but I, at the same time i think i think it's perfect as well otherwise you know look at soup a completely different genre but if you look at that what is it that latest superman one where the last battle was Ugh. what like 35 40 <laughs> minutes please I, don't get me started on man <laughs> <Steel>. all <laughs> right <laughs> I, please we don't have enough time to go over 
all the problems I had with that movie. Yeah, but th- that, that's, that's what I'm saying. You had a 40-minute battle there or whatever it was, and that was way too long. Oh, God. So, so yeah, so I think problems. it seemed fast, but at the same time, I think it was perfect. Cool. You know, it, because any, any longer, you might have gotten tired of it. Yeah, I think, look, if, if I had to rate the movie, it would probably be like a, a solid four, four and a half stars out of five. For it. I got a lot of, of enjoyment out of it, and just it, it's the kind of horror that I really dig, and that it, it doesn't rely on all these the jumps and stuff like that, the the stunts, I guess you could say. Right. It it got into you. It's, it it just gets under your skin, and it's just un, unnerving to watch. So I I dug it. I dug it a lot. Now, I know to to maybe give a wide berth to the second one if I were to pursue this further with the uh, the, the series, but. We'll see. I, I, am, I am interested in the book. Whether or not I'll ever have time to read it uh, is another story, but right. I don't know. I'll have to look it up. But I'm curious to what uh, ZigZag has to say about it, though. Now, the second one is a lot of fun if you have a lot of friends over. Yeah. <laughs> that's only it. one of those. Do, yeah, but the third one, the third one, oof. I like the third one equally, and some days I like it more. Uh, than the, and wow. the third one was actually directed by the writer uh, Blatty. Cool. He wrote and directed. He wrote the first one, and then he wrote and directed the third one. And it's unfortunate because there is a director's cut out there. The producers cut a lot of it. There, rephrase. There is no director's cut out there. There, it's it's missing. So there's this mysterious, you know, legendary cut of uh, an amazing movie that we'll probably never see. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so yeah, I, I'd highly recommend, if you like this, I highly recommend the third one. It's, um, it's slightly different, but it's like T2. It's just as good, just a different kind of feel to it. Is the second one necessary viewing to get to the third? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. Um, I actually want the second one because it's that bad. Wow. It's so bad. But no. No, you can totally skip the second one and miss nothing. Linda Blair's in the second one, but she's not even in the, in the third one. Wow. She has nothing to do with the third one at all. All right. So it's good. Cool. I'm glad you liked it, man. I, I was. Did. I, it was. It was. I, I figured you kind of like this one because you do have a, a sensible mentality when it comes to to. to it's okay. It's a slur, slow burn. I have that feeling, but uh, it's still a forty year old movie. That so I'm glad. Yeah. glad well, we got I am. I am too because it would have been a really awkward second episode if I just came in and shit all over your first movie request. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah, that, so we're good there. All, all right. right. So all right. So that's. I watched that. I watched this. So. Last week, you also, or last episode, you read Colder. Yes. Tell me, tell me what you thought about that. Um, Colder. I, I got to read Colder, written by Paul Tobin, mm-hmm. and uh, the artist is I'm gonna uh, Juan Ferrara. Okay, good Juan Ferrara. Um, wow. Um, wow. Let me go to my notes. There's I want to talk about. Uh, there's quite a few things I talk about. Um. You've mentioned in many of your comic reviews, not many, it comes and it goes, um, how something terrifies you or something is very scary. I've never said anything about it because I don't read comics, but in the kind of the back of my mind, I'm, I've, I've thought, huh, I don't know how something, a comic, could be scary. Yeah. I freely admit that. Until now, I can understand where you're coming from now because the art in this graphic novel is just terrifying there are just amazing things going on these little men where everybody's an eyeball oh those guys <laughs> these teeth monsters um uh everything about like that and that's the thing like they and i've seen panels at comic cons where they talk about like how can comics be scary you don't have you, you you're just reading a book like how but i mean look you have stephen king who's who's made you have tons and tons of horror writers out there who made livings off of horror novels where it's just words and it's yeah. scary but comics for some reason it's just been always like oh yeah you know it's kid stuff or any of that garbage but it's it's i think it's more challenging but when it delivers it works so oh. well and what they have is the page turn that's what you have and you don't you don't get it as much in the digital world but the page turn when you flip that page and all of a sudden you're confronted with some crazy shit or something you weren't expecting or something you were dreading yes that's when a that's when a comic can really deliver on on a horror level yes one thing i liked in your review is you said 
and I, this is really accurate. The story is a good story. Um, for the story, I suggest y'all go and read um, James's review because he sums it up very well, sums it up better than I ever could. Uh, it's basically about this guy. I'll let James explain it. Sure, so, <laughs> so essentially, it's, it's almost tough to describe because so it's about this guy named Declan who was in some sort of mental asylum and he's touched by this character, not touched in that way, but touched by this guy named Nimble Jack, who's the best way that I've found to describe him is think of like the Joker if he had kind of omniscient powers where he's able to kind of flow between reality and he feeds on insanity. So years later, Declan wakes up kind of and Nimble Jack had forgotten about him and then he suddenly comes back and, and finds him again and he wants to eat Declan because he sees Declan as this kind of like fine wine that's aged for all these years and his body has become colder. That's where the title comes from. He's so he's about like 48 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas the normal bo- normal human body is like 98 degrees. So he's he's for some reason getting colder and colder and colder. And he they end up going into these worlds of 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 insanity. And you see what what crazy people see and how they how they view the world. And it's just this kind of weird battle between Declan and Nimble Jack with this woman's life hanging in the balance. And the, that world they go into... The Hungry World, it's called. Wow. Wow. Just everything. And I really... And you you had said in your review, it's a good story, and it is. It's an enjoyable story that I would read otherwise. But the art, the art takes it to this phenomenal level. that I'm, The art is just amazing and in, in this book it's, what's it's great it's, what's great too is like right now there's there's this weird discussion going on in the comic book industry about people not appreciating artists and not you know that, that art isn't the first person's first thing someone thinks of when they buy a comic they're thinking of the writer first or the characters huh. they're not thinking of the artists and someone like juan ferrara i would buy anything he draws after yes. reading Soldier. And and I I am a I I am guilty of of this problem too where I I follow writers first I think if if a book looks great and it has a shitty story it's still a bad comic but if yes. a book has a great story and an okay or crappy art it can still be an okay comic and that's that's just how I I've, I've grown to appreciate the industry but for something like Juan Ferrara's artwork again anything that this guy touches i'm in and i know he just actually has been working on a book for on uh on dc called gotham by midnight that i really have to look up now because yeah. if it if it's anything like this i have to i have to read it and just inhale it it's yeah it's 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 something <laughs> i mean it's, it's it's understating it but the, the, it's funny because there's a particular scene where he's dragging her into the the crazy world for the first time, and it looked like an aha video. That aha video take on me because they're half. Um, it's not black and white. It's really it's gray and 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 murky and fog like. But it's, it's it's that was the first thing that came to my mind. I just started laughing, but then <laughs> I stopped laughing when I saw what was in that world, and it was it was terrifying. But to give the writing credit too because i don't want to i don't yeah. want to i don't i don't want the the writer to think no it, there was a line in there that i thought was i even typed it out um uh, De, uh De, De, declan yeah. said uh declan said the thing about us about humans is that we're basically walking talking bags of ego mm-hmm. we think we know it all that we see and, and we see in to all the hidden places, but deep down we know how ridiculous that is. We wonder about certain noises and certain sights and the cold spots, of course. Yeah. And I, that really hit home because I, I everybody has an ego, but I mean, you can be as badass as you want to be, but at the end of the day, see, I live alone, and at the <laughs> end of the day, in the middle of the night, many times I sleep with the TV on, so I don't hear the house settling. And I got to talking to a friend of mine about it, and he and he laughed, and he goes, "Yeah, when the wife goes out of town, I sleep with the radio on." And, <laughs> and it, as badass as we can think of ourselves, at the end of the day, everybody hears those house noises, yeah. and everybody wonders, "Wait a minute, what was that? 
wait a minute. And I, yeah. that, and, I and it's so accurate. And I, and I really thought that was, and that's tough to do in a comic because you do have a limited speech bubble. You know, you can't yeah. fill up the, and it was really, really hit me, it hit home. And I was like, wow, this is, this is kind of deep. Um, going back to the art when they, when they went into the, the crazy world, when she, he would declare was showing her, uh, when he was in that mental hospital where, where shit hit the fan, yeah. um, he turns around and there's, there's that lady behind the desk, but all you see is her head. It gave me a little jump because I go to the panel. I'm like, Oh my God, what is that? <laughs> um, all the crazy people were terrifying. Oh, they were, uh, there, there was a, the one big fat guy who's just like, yeah. Yeah, he's on fire. I like oh, fire. Yeah, he's just like, <laughs> it's eating me. It's like, you're on fire, dude. Stop it. Um, the taxi scene when she got dragged. Oh, the, the oh arms. God, yeah, and she got dragged from the top of the, yeah. the, the so ceiling or roof or whatever. That's in, that's in, I think, the fourth issue where, yeah, he, they get into attack. I mean, it's a little bit of a spoilers because it's at the very end of the of that chapter. But, yeah, yeah, they get into a taxi and then, like, all of it, he turns around and then he looks back at her and she's being, like, gobbled up. All these arms have popped out of the ceiling, and they're pulling her into the ceiling of the taxi. But it's not like she's going out of the taxi. She's disappearing. Yes! <laughs> uh, and, and speaking of arms, we'll let we'll let the listener get to the arm creature. Oh, yeah, you don't think that's terrifying, listener. <laughs> Whatever. You, how can arms be scary? They, right, <laughs> well, it's that, and then the uh, the dogs. The dogs that their their bodies are made of hands. And and it's just you, you have a dog head. Think of thing from the Adams family, but instead of like a wrist, it's a it's a big dog's head, like Spuds McKenzie dog head, and just they're terrifying. And I remember I spoke, I had the pleasure of interviewing Paul Tobin, the writer at New York Comic Con last year, and I, I talked to him about it. And he he said he just told the he just told Juan Ferrara just draw some dogs, and that's what he came out with. Oh. Like think about that. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. And and the, the, I love I. In, in, at least in the graphic novel, at the end where he was talking about the cover uh, with the hand going yeah. up, and he said, we knew we had a winner because both my – I believe he said his wife and, and the writer's wife. Yeah, and the, editor, and the editor's wife. Yeah. <laughs> they screamed. They said, this is it. Yeah. Um, Which, yeah, so I, if, if you look it up, that, so it's a picture of Declan, and he's literally shoving his hands up in up his mouth, and then pops out of his eye socket. It's oh. it's just so creepy. They Dark Horse was the publisher was sending that out to people as a teaser, and the the uh, caption was Dark Horse uh, gets under your skin. Oh, and, wow. fitting, yeah. That the the other thing I wrote down were, were the fairy tales, the three pigs, the three bears. Yeah. And, oh my God! Again. How how ooh th- three pigs ooh and then I saw the pigs I'm like Jesus that yeah. no nope. I would I would <laughs> love to read a book of fairy tales re- uh, illustrated by Juan Ferrara but that that gets into the 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 Hunger World how crazy that is because I think the the line is uh, Nimble Jack says oh it's it's a forty story drop and here's the first what? story and it's it's the three little pigs and it's just like that's the kind of crazy shit that happens in this book and that's what I think scared me the most about it is that. Anything can happen. Jack yeah. can do anything, and, and you don't know what to expect. He's not a slasher stalking someone through through uh, the woods or something. You, she, he's not just going to cut someone up with a machete. He oh. might just uh, like rip someone in half just be, because just he wants to, and he gets bored, and that's what he'll do. And the character is so effectively creepy. He's punny, which I normally hate punny bullshit. But he's punny, and I let him get away with it because he's kind of freaky and terrifying, and it's not him. It's just another level of him. He might be punny, but I'm not going to call him on it because it's just – and I, I think it's unfortunate that I this character really has a good – this Nimble Jack character really has a great look about him that almost seems like – we were talking before we yeah. – so that it almost seems like he was ripped off by this new Joker and this new thing. In the Suicide Squad, yeah. Yes. And look, there's a very, very close similarity. And I mean, even the character, Nimble Jack, it, it is like the Joker. Honestly, I think I said, I think I just sent you my review for the, the, they just started the third volume of this, the third and final volume. It's called Toss oh. the Bones. And I talk about Jack in it where it says, you know, he's he's like what the what the Joker aspires to be. And, right. and that's, that's, I think, a great way to describe him. 
And it's unfortunate because because if this ever gets made into a movie, people will say, oh, you're ripping off the yeah. uh, Joker. I'm like, no, it's not like that. Uh, get all hipster. I knew it before <laughs> it was the Joker. But it, but then I you know I I I'm uh, I'm admittedly already looking forward to the second graphic novel yeah. on this because the end of it i'll just say fingers oh yeah oh, so what that's, the hell yeah that, the <laughs> epilogue for that it, it leads into the bad seed which is the second volume that you will you will never look at hands or fingers the same way after reading that book it is so like if you thought this stuff was creepy just I, I want to. I'm going to tease you i'm going to te- give you one small tease there's a panel where they're going in between the hungry world and the real world and Reese, the girl in the in the book, reaches out to grab a doorknob, and she go when she goes to grab it, she looks down and notices she has too many fingers on her hands, oh. and it's just such like a subtle <laughs> thing. And you look down, all of a sudden you see you have like six or seven fingers on your hand. Like how would you react to that? Like out of nowhere, you see that, and it's just it's it's that kind of like subtle, creepy feeling that makes these books so terrifying yeah and i'm gonna say i'm gonna say you knocked it out of the park with this recommendation because like you know this is why we started it i very rarely read comics and i used to know somebody who owned a comic store and he knew my taste in both art and uh and writing so he say you'd like this you'd like this you'd like this and he's the one that turned me on to the walking dead and he even said You'll like the story here. You're going to hate the art. And he was right. I I never liked the art of The Walking Dead. I'm sure the guy's great. It's not my – I'm not going to knock the artist by any stretch because I think to each your own for sure. I just always liked the story, and I thought the art was – I like color. I like art just like this in this this book right here. Um, It's it's comic booky without being comic booky, and that's an awful description. (laughs) But I'm looking at this stuff, and you've said in your reviews in the past I would like – a panel as artwork on my wall. Yeah. And as I'm looking through this colder, I'm thinking I will take many of these panels <laughs> and post on my wall, but not the wall in my bedroom and <laughs> the wall in my office because yeah. I cannot look at this before I go to sleep. No, no, no. But it's a, it's a solid book. I mean, I can't, I, 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 the, I told you the third one just started or it's about to start rather at the time of this recording. And it's, it's, it's just as creepy. It's they're getting these guys. They actually did the creative team did one of the mini series. They um, Dark Horse has the license for Aliens and Predator, and they oh. did this big maxi series called Fire and Stone, where they had a different mini. It was four issue mini series for Prometheus, Alien, Aliens versus Predator, and Predator. And they these this creative team did Prometheus, and they had these weird little like alien monkeys that come out they're, they're like think of think of the xenomorphs from aliens but crossbred with a monkey and it's, it's it's just weird and scary but it's all these like you would i would love to see a movie made by that like that would have made prometheus so much cooler with that stuff yeah. so i mean anything these guys work to, if they continue to work together and do more stuff i'm i'm all for it i can't see why colder's not a movie yet maybe directed by Guillermo oh. del toro oh because- That'd be awesome. <laughs> this is this is like, I, I'm so tired. I am so tired of superhero movies. I don't care what's coming out. I'm so tired of them. If we're gonna get delve into comics, why can't we do colder? Well, like, there there are yeah. a lot, and I think what's happening. I haven't heard any announcements about that one in particular, but I wouldn't be surprised if it gets picked up very soon. There, it's. I think that the other studios are noticing that there's all this all this rich IP out there, and right. I mean, every day I feel there's another announcement of another book that just got that's getting adapted. So it's, it, it, it's funny that this this was put out by Dark Horse because back in the day, like back in the I see I would say early '90s, I actually did collect comics, um, but Dark Horse was a favorite, and they were brand new back then. But I remember them coming out. They were different. You know what I mean? They're, they're like, oh, this is different. This is different. So I'm kind of glad that it kinda, it's almost like full circle. You're introducing me into some new stuff here. And the first one is a is a company that I loved when I actually read comics. Oh, God. 25 Wait. years ago. <laughs> you read comics at like the worst time to read comics in the history of the <laughs> industry. I understand, too. <laughs> I have four boxes downstairs. <laughs> and I said to my buddy who owned the comic book store, I said, I got four boxes. He goes, from when? I was like, from 90 to 90, 40. He goes, yeah. 
Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, throw them in the garbage. <laughs> They're worthless. But I have uh, the McFarland. <laughs> so does everyone else. Yeah. No, no, that's what. Oh my gosh, there's nothing. <laughs> But yeah, but I don't care. I have a lot of Punishers. Yeah, that's what I liked. I never liked Superman. I never liked. Uh, I never liked. Uh, I liked the dark, the de- the detective comics, but not Batman. Mm-hmm. Um, but I always liked. And so I guess that's what like when I would go to the comic book store. That's how I got the last comic I think I read outside of The Walking Dead was Supreme Powers. Supreme Power, yeah. From uh, oh, yeah. God. that was like that's... a reinterpretation of the Justice League. Oh, yeah, and better. Yeah. <laughs> That was their Max series. <laughs> that was, yeah, that one I'd like to watch a movie of that. That, that, that is just genius. A, a serial killer with superpowers always blew me away. But yeah, but go back to Colder. That yes, yes, good call. Uh, as you saw on my Goodreads, I gave it five. Uh, I loved it. Loved every. Uh, you know, it's funny. The only if I took one issue with it, um, I let it slide though. But it's the same kind of issue that you brought up with the Exorcist is. The ending felt a little bit rushed. A little. And it, it's almost like one of those things, it, it ends on this little, like, ha moment. And, and it's, yes. it's almost, it's all, it almost doesn't fit the book because, it, you know, they, they went through this whole journey and then it just ends like that. And you're kind of like, oh, like that. It's, it's like a sitcom ending almost. And it, yes. it doesn't do the book justice. No. You, yes. There, there's, there, there comes a moment, and this is a spoiler, so speed up a little bit. When all of a sudden, uh, De- Declan, Declan, yeah. All of a sudden, Declan has power, and I didn't. Where did that come from? Well, it's kind of it, you get nods to it and how he's able to kind of cure crazy people. Yes. So you kind of see that. So he's def- there's something like something going on with him, and then they allude to it with the the test that they were doing at the psychiatric hospital. Yes. So they're like, oh, you gave this guy forty, you know, forty times the recommended right. dose of this weird drug, and I guess that's what kind of made him have that plus not for nothing he was kind of catatonic in a in a cold state for like 40 or 50 years or something right, so right, right i like how they explain that too put it on ice and you're not going to age I, I, I thought that was yeah. nice that was uh it wasn't cheating yeah now do they do they explain his power like more in the next not a little bit in the bad sea they get more into his history and what how he ended up in the mental asylum Okay. And then Toss the Bones, which is the new one, is kind of dealing with some of the revelations from the Bad Seed and, you know, what what they're going to do next and how they'll ultimately wrap up the book. So I, it's you get some of it, I think. It's not everything, but it, it definitely opens up the a lot of Declan's past. And I But I, my problem with it is that you're getting some of this from what might be an unreliable narrator. So <gasps> you're kind of oh. like, I don't know if he's telling them this to you know, try to scare him or to get him to do something or if this is true or not. So I don't know. Well, we'll, we can talk about that after you've read that one too, but yes. uh, it's, it's, it's also, also a solid book. That was my number two pick of the year for 2014. Uh, it was worth seat. it. Worth it. Worth it. Uh, uh, I should have read this uh, when you picked it uh, in 2014. Well, I'm sorry. No, Col- I'm sorry. Let me back up. Calder would have been my number, my number one pick for 2013. The bad seed Oh, sequel was number two for last year. So, wow, that's how that shaken out. So yeah, I mean, two in a row in in the top two for me for the year, for years. Yeah, I can see it, man. It's it's a good choice. Cool. All right, so we covered. That's that's what we've we've read and watched. So now right let's let's move right into the next week's recommendations. We'll we'll. Uh, what is your recommendation for me for the next uh, movie pick? Um. I'm going to preface this with, I don't think you're going to like this as much as you like The Exorcist. This movie is going to make you feel dirty and filthy. Um, and it's, Beverly Hills Chihuahua. <laughs> it's, uh, it's terrifying because it's not supernatural. Um, but it's, 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 it's one of those, as, I, as I've said often, you have to do your homework and you have to, this is part of the homework. It's going to be Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. Okay. It's uh, Michael That's, Rooker. Yeah, I was going to say, it's Michael Rooker. That's the extent of what I know about that movie, is that Michael Rooker's in it. And I think I've seen the cover of the DVD, and he's, like, shirtless in a bathroom or something. And I think yes. that's, that's the all again, all I know about that movie. I will say this. Um, before you watch it, this movie sat on the shelf, I believe, for three, four, or five years before it was even released. Because people – I don't know. I can't remember why exactly it wasn't released, but um, Rooker – 
was getting jobs off of his performance in this movie that hadn't been released yet. Wow. That's how good his performance is. Well, it's, it's, it's he people said, oh, my God, I heard about this guy in this movie that's not released, but we got to get him in here. So but this is one that's 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 uh, brutal. Uh, I don't think you'll like it as much, but I'm I'm curious to hear your thoughts after you see it. Cool. It sounds like I'm saying I'm sending you something that you're not going to like. I, I don't think you're going to like it in the regards of not that it's not a good movie. You, I just don't think you're going to like the way it makes you feel. If that makes sense, it's uh, it's um, yeah, we'll let you watch it. And right. then get to That's it. cool. I'll, I'll, I, like I said, I've heard of that one. I don't, I don't know anything about it. So just yeah. totally new. All right. Awesome. So my my recommendation for you is uh, so going from the weird, tough to describe horror in colder, we're going to a monster book this time. This is a werewolf comic called Curse. Good. It it was released. Uh, in 2014, it, from Boom Studios, the book is written by Michael Morrissey and Tim Daniel, and it's illustrated by Riley Rosmo and Colin Lorimer. This is, you know, what you're saying before about how you know, oh, we know your your the types of books you like or the types of art you like. I think you will like Colin Lorimer's art. I think you may be not like Riley Rossmo's art as much. And I, I will tell you, look, full disclosure, I didn't care for this guy's art right away. It's a, it's a, he's an artist that grew on me okay. as I read more of his work. Curse was probably the second or third book I've read by him. But the way it's kind of split up in terms of the art duties, Riley Rossmo handles the werewolf scenes and Colin Lormel ha- handles a- like just about everything else. So the, this book is about this uh, guy who's, I think he's a former like football player, and he's basically washed up. He has no money, and he has a son with leukemia who's, who he, he can't pay for his medical treatments. And he finds out that there's some murderer out in the woods that has a big bounty on his head, and he decides to go out there and find this murderer and bring him in so he can get the bounty money, and it's a werewolf. <laughs> It never works out. No, but it doesn't go. It doesn't go the way you're thinking. And the reason why okay. I'm recommending this is, it's not just like the, I don't know about you, but the way I look at monster books or monster stories in general is, it's like it needs to have something more. It can't just be like, and here's this crazy creature tearing ass for an hour and a half. It's got to yeah. have something. I have to care about it. So this main character story, I think his name is Laney. His main this Laney's story is just interesting and I'm curious as to how it will affect you because I think it tugged on my heartstrings a lot because I have kids. Okay. So, and I think I'm seeing this and I'm seeing how this guy will do anything and risk, you know, a, a very risk his own life to go out into the woods and find this murderer, which again, turns out to be a werewolf for his kid. And you know, things that I, I you know I would do anything for my children. And I'm just like, I'm curious as to what you think what you will think reading is uh, after coming from it from a different mindset. Yes. Um, I'm glad. I almost feel bad now because you're throwing at me. One of my favorite genres is werewolf. Okay. And I'm giving you something that you may. No, don't. No, that's, that, that's not how this is set up. It's not just like, no, no, it's not. things we like. I'm not, I'm not changing it. No, no. <laughs> um, I did want to mention, and this is kind of going back to the exorcist. Did you happen to um, look at the video I had put on my blog about, the reaction of the exorcist in the seventies. Not yet. I have to look okay. it up though. If it's not, a, I'll, I'll shoot it to you or put yeah. it on your wall. On Facebook. We'll talk, uh, we'll talk about it next time. Then we'll yes. have like a quick, you know, catch up notes section. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. And we also, and, and for the listeners, we're going to work out, um, spoiler alerts, uh, <laughs> well, for I, the next I think time. There, I, I think there should be a kind of, especially for the parts that we're reviewing the books and movies, it, there should be spoiler alerts in that, in that anyway, because look, we're going to be talking about everything that happened in those things. Right. So, sorry. This stuff, like, so now, look, we seeded this out. We have Henry Portia, the serial killer. We have Curse. You know, fans at home, if you want to watch or read those, it's easy, you know, easy to pick up and, and do that before diving into the next episode where we're going to be talking about those in, de- in more detail. I think that's fair because this isn't a review podcast. This no. is a discussion podcast. So I think we'll just start everyone. There are spoilers. Here's what we're doing. Maybe come back later. Yeah. Because because. Yeah, you're right. This is going to be different. This is not we're going we're going for discussion and not not review. We're hoping you've already seen it or planned on seeing it. Yeah. So and but also we'll definitely want to hear from you guys. So if yeah. you have anything, you have any other thoughts or something we might have missed or or 
you agree or disagree with what we're saying about some of these books and movies, uh, definitely hit us up via email. Watch this. Read that at HorrorTalk.com. Or hopefully when we have it set up and live, hopefully there'll be a comment box. Yeah. Yeah. So we're still we're still working this slight spoilers for uh, we'll, we'll give you a peek behind the curtain and that we're recording a couple of these ahead of time. And then you're going to get these on a regular basis. So but still want to hear from you guys. I still definitely want to, uh, you know, get that feedback going because it'll be it'll be good to have further that discussion. And, and mm-hmm. I'm curious what other people might think of if they're discovering some of these books or movies uh, in the same manner that we are. And it helps us, you know. What do you like? What do you don't like? Let us know, man. Because yeah. I, I'm I'm new to this. This is my first <laughs> time. Uh, I'm a virgin to the. I listen to a lot of podcasts. Doesn't mean I can entertain you like those great podcasts that entertain me. So if you don't like something or you like something that we should keep doing or we should stop doing, definitely throw yeah. it at us. Just don't tell us the podcast because we're still going to start keep doing this podcast. So telling us to stop. <laughs> That's not going to be enough. Sorry. <laughs> exactly. All right, cool. So I, I think that that wraps it up. So next time we'll we'll meet, we'll review what you thought about Curse, what I thought about Henry, and uh, we'll go into the next batch of recommendations. So I guess until then, this has been If You Watch This, I'll Read That. I'm James Ferguson. And I'm Steve Pat T. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye. That's it. You've been listening to Funny Book Splatter, a horror comics podcast brought to you by HorrorTalk.com. We've been bringing you the best in horror since 2002. In addition to comics, we cover movies, TV shows, books, and video games. We've got news, reviews, guest features, interviews, unboxing videos, and much more. Be sure to sign up to Steve's Deals newsletter to increase your horror collection without breaking the bank. Check us out at HorrorTalk.com and at HorrorTalk on Twitter.